And if you consider the fact that men are more likely to be imprisoned and serve longer jail sentences than women, and that they're also more likely to serve more time for the same sentences, again, it becomes quite clear that it's a way of capitalizing on a man's most precious asset, the only one that can compete with the value of female reproductive ability, that is, his utility. War is another vehicle for the deprivation of male utility. It essentially conscripts a man's body as a weapon of war for the protection of the female collective, who of course is tucked nicely into the inner recesses of society where harm is much less likely. Now, in a country such as America, where the total financial military expenditures outpace any other competition by a huge margin, the average starting base pay for an entry-level private can be as low as 17000 a year, whilst the average per capita income in the U.S. fluctuates at around 40000 a year. Now, nobody denies that a military is essential to the national security of a nation, but what we have here in the American male soldier is essentially a tool who is being used to wage war on other men for interests he'll probably never discern for himself and for wages that can barely be said to approach any measure of self-sufficiency. Boys must be instructed to see military service as at best a necessary evil to be engaged in only when he is absolutely convinced that not doing so will pose an imminent danger to him and his countrymen and his family, and at worst it should be looked at as an exploitative conscription expected only of men where men don't, you know, accelerate their lives or, you know, become an army of one or, or whatever other bullshit feel good appeal to masculinity the military PR agencies gin up, but where men die voluntarily at the hands of other men. We need to teach men that they are better than a piece of meat forged as a weapon of war to kill other men. We need to tap back into the survival instinct of men, and we need to make men feel almost ashamed to serve in the military. Now, I'm not saying every war is unjust or unwarranted, but men should view any effort on their part to fight for nations and institutions against other men as, at best, a deeply saddening, albeit sometimes necessary action, but never the supposedly masculine, violence glorification orgy that we see today. It shouldn't be cool or manly to allow yourself to be used as a weapon of war. It should be shunned, viewed almost as a cop-out or as a last resort. War isn't cool. Folks, you understand that? War is violence and death and blood. There's nothing manly about it. It's time we let men fight for what they actually believe in. Not for a flag and not for a country, but for him and those important to him, whoever they may be. And taking that into account, men must be taught to be extremely selective towards who they would risk their lives for. It is imperative that we begin to emulate women in terms of their obsession with their health. Now again, the concept of utility applies here. Men are simply terrified of not being useful to women. What potential to protect and provide can you offer if you're not healthy enough to, pro to protect and provide for yourself? The paradox, of course, is that the more you strive to render that provision, the unhealthier you'll be. Uh, let's face it, prolonged periods of providing for not only yourself, but other family members is a prescription for higher amounts of stress, less free time devoted to leisure or hobby, less free time devoted to exercise, diet, and overall health. So the more we teach men to conserve and build their wealth, the more we instill a cold, callous approach to the dispensing of the fruits of their labors to rival the unceasing Kelvin-scale cold that women exhibit towards who they will dole out their re reproductive services to, the more we can, of course, expect to see an increase in male health and life expectancy based solely off the fact that men will have had to have worked less to, quote, provide for the useless, you know, plasticky, extraneous bullshit that takes the female collective's materialistic fancy in any given year or day, or month. With that said, uh, though, men still, bottom line, and to be as frank as possible, would rather let their health problems coalesce and build until it grows much, much worse. Men are still more likely to avoid the doctor than women, and that's a choice. You know, that, that's a flaw within us. That's something that we are responsible for. The more women's obsession with their health looks unreasonable to your male mind, the more you should strive to emulate it. Now, I have what, what can only be described as a borderline overzealous relationship with my doctor. If I sneeze the wrong way, I go to my doctor. And you know where I learned that from? I learned it from women. And men need to learn it too. We need to educate males from boyhood about the prostate, about testosterone, about the things that make them male. We need to show a willingness to spend money on research into optimum male health and diet and exercise regimens. We need to demand, absolutely, that any government dollars spent on health care will be spent on men as much as women. We need to aggressively pursue scientific study into cancers of the prostate, testicular cancer, and any and all other male-specific diseases or disorders.
we, meaning men, need to re-enter, this is key, we need to re-enter the discussion on male mental health by any means necessary. Now because of the whole Sandy Hook thing, there's a huge debate going on about male mental health and almost all of the discussion is taking place within a context of blame and stigmatization of men and particularly boys. We need to push our way militantly if need be into academia on all levels and demand that men be allowed access to boys in education, period. We need to fight to get them away from the system that women and feminists exist in. And we need to reconnect them with the presence of masculinity from the very earliest ages. And the fact is that they have failed boys miserably. I would go as far as to say that the amount to which these women have failed boys, and yes, I'm making a prejudicial statement about female educators, deal with it or unsubscribe, that, that, that the amount to which these women have failed boys is, is, is borderline criminal. And what they've done essentially is to rob boys of their destiny because they don't learn the pathetic way that women do. You know, they fidget, they clamor, they explore, they discover, and that, they said, was a mental health, quote, problem. And they proceeded then to medicate away everything good about boys because they just didn't care. They just didn't give a fuck. Well, if female educators can't protect boys, then men will have to step in and do it militantly until the issue is resolved. And, and, and by the way, serotonin reuptake inhibitors are not a resolution under any context at all, full stop. I mean, let's actually discuss the details here, especially in terms of these serotonin reuptake inhibitors that are being prescribed to boys, uh, because it, we have to put into context what's actually going on here, just in case there's any confusion as to what the actual crime that took place really is. We're dealing with a mass miseducation of boys. We do know that serotonin reuptake inhibitors have a mechanism of action where the reuptake channels of neurosynaptic junctions are blocked because a, a drug such as Prozac or Luvox or whatever does not allow the nerve issuing the neurotransmitters to take them back afterwards. The human brain, of course, is known for its propensity not towards being a static physiological organ, but as an organ of change and neuronal plasticity. So with enough external biochemical manipulation, the brain will learn that the patient taking these medications is for whatever reason pursuing increased serotonergenic activity. The brain naturally seeks to curb this excess. Presynaptic neurons sending the message excrete less serotonin. Postsynaptic neurons receiving the message constrict the serotonin receptors receiving it. And so in prescribing these medications to our young boys, we literally are hampering their ability to feel happiness as a normal person should. The phenomena is described scientifically as tardive dysphoria, and there's a, a, a very interesting link in the low bar for those of you who want to get more acquainted with that term. But basically, uh, it, it means that prolonged ingestion of these uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitors cause depressive symptoms so severe that normal approaches, including the, 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 the consumption of these SSRI drugs, no longer have any perceivable effect on depression. And this was all under the auspices of the supposedly more nurturing gender, you know. We're talking about the soccer moms who insist that daddy work to pay the bills, but trust some, you know, school psychologist to his and her own son's mental well-being to the point where she allows him to be drugged. Again, this is all because we're instructing boys under predominantly female teachers who don't understand how they learn and quite frankly can't understand how they learn. And this isn't fully feminism here. You know, although without a doubt, feminists rejoice at the fact that young boys are being put on these uh, medications. The invention of Prozac didn't come around until the late 1980s and, and was only beginning to be prescribed on a massive scale during the mid-90s. So this situation derived not from feminism, but from the false notion that women are more nurturing and thus better suited than men are to teach children at the elementary level and even at the preliminary adolescent levels when many of the so-called behavioral problems associated with male learning occur. In other words, the female saturation that boys are confronted with are a manifestation of the veneration of motherhood, the divine feminism which has its roots in traditionalist constructs and customs. So again, what's needed here is an aggressive, culturally militant push on the part of men who give a fuck about boys, you know, not restoring the family, not repairing gender relations, but men that actually care about boys, forcing their way back into the school systems armed with studies highlighting gender differences in adolescent boys and girls, showing that we do in fact learn differently and that we want men who understand boys to teach boys. Look at a picture of Albert Einstein's desk here. Do you see deadlines here? Or, or, or do you see any neat order structured female learning here? You see any papers handed in all neat and nice that say exactly what the teacher wants to hear on this desk? No, it's just cluttered, adventurous brilliance. Men who understand boys 
Don't tell boys that the speed of gravity accelerates an object at 9.8 meters squared towards the Earth. They get a strobe light, they get a board with equally spaced black and white strips, they record something falling through these equally spaced strips, and they literally show them with stopwatches and with superimpositions of the images that the object is in fact accelerating towards Earth, that the object is in fact clearing these equally spaced black and white strips at a faster rate when it's closer to the earth than when it started falling originally. That's how boys learn. Let female teachers teach their rote learning memorized garbage to girls if it's so damn effective. That's not good enough for boys and they deserve much better. You know, I bet you then we'll see a huge decrease in the so-called mental health problems that boys are facing when this kind of education is implemented. The graphic here the graphic you're seeing is just unacceptable. If need be, we're going to have to push for gender segregated schooling. Anything to ensure that boys and men are once again able to have contact away from women and in the presence of masculinity in the educative process. Now, finally, as a way of attempting to jumpstart or extending